Good evening, everyone. This is Luke Grand speaking. If you can hear me, send a quick note in the chat box, would you? Thank you. Welcome to our 2011 Spring Farminar Series. This is the beginning of a new round every week through March and the first week of April. On uh, Tuesday evenings, we'll be having these 90-minute uh, sessions with farmers speaking with other farmers and sharing uh, ideas and some knowledge, too. Um, and we are really happy to have you here. Uh, we are thankful as well to the Farm Aid and the Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Program, whose grants are funding the series and actually fund the farmers who are seeking to share their share their knowledge freely uh, with everyone uh, in attendance. So we are very glad you're here, and we hope you can come back and, and hit every single Tuesday night uh, for the next five weeks, six weeks, and uh, learn a bunch from farmers online for free. I just wanted to make one note here. If you could look to the right of your screen and be sure to click the radio button next to the number of folks that are watching this with you. And also uh, keep in mind, uh, we'd love to get your feedback on how we do tonight. So we will be sending out a quick survey. Uh, so if you could just put your email in the chat box, either as a private message to me or in the, in the group chat box, that would be great. I want to encourage everyone who's in attendance tonight to join Practical Farmers of Iowa. Practical Farmers of Iowa is a wonderful nonprofit organization whose rich network of over 26 years of folks uh, sharing knowledge and, and learning from each other uh, is, is what gives us this opportunity to bring folks like Eric Franzenberg and Morgan Honig to you, to, to you tonight. So by joining Practical Farmers of Iowa, you're helping to extend this uh, wonderful resource that's in the knowledge of our membership uh, to, another, uh, to another generation. And also keep in mind that uh, our archive library is available for free, so you can watch all these farminars again if you wanted to go back and and, uh, and you know want to catch something else you might not have heard the first time around. Those are available online for free. Quick update on what's had, what's happening at our, at our office. We are a members uh, members organization, and we are very focused on what our members want. And uh, what they want is research. They want they're curious, and they want to know more information about what's going on on their farms and to share that, that, wis that wisdom they, they find out through research. So we are setting up research projects right now with uh, folks all across Iowa, and uh, we, we will be uh, sharing that knowledge as we have uh, for 20 years on our website for free. We're also planning field days, which every year we do about 30 uh, events from uh, June through November at farms across, the, across Iowa. And we're planning those field days right now and uh, should have a field day guide out to members by the middle of May. Finally, we are a grant-driven uh, organization, and we're funded by grants. Uh, my salary, as well as all staff, are funded through grants. So we do continually write grants th throughout the year, but especially in this time of year, that's what we're doing to continue to provide uh, the services at Practical Farmers of Iowa. So tonight, we're going to learn from Eric Eric Franzenberg, longtime PFI member and former board president, and uh, Morgan Honig, a beginning farmer and a beginning PFI member, on the topic of managing farm labor. And I would just ask that uh, we could try to reserve questions from the from the audience uh, until after Morgan has uh, had a chance to ask her questions. But we'll definitely have time at the end for everyone's questions. Uh, so definitely put those questions in at the end when I uh, when I give you the cue. So the next cue is to line up Eric Franzenberg and his, and his slideshow. And I'll do that now. And Eric, you can begin when you're ready. Thanks, Luke. Just to give you some background on our farm operation, um, I started farming in uh, 1993 with my wife and one, uh, our, young, our oldest daughter. Um, we quickly decided that we were not interested in, in farming uh, thousands of acres of corn and soybeans. So we decided to take a different approach to farming and decided that we were going to look at opportunities where we could make more money on fewer acres or more money per acre basis. So we started out doing that in 93 and uh, began looking at um, one option through our rural economic development program of growing culinary and medicinal herbs for businesses in Iowa because there was indeed uh, some demand from Tones Company, uh, the Tones Brothers in Ankeny, and then also from a company in Norway, Iowa, called Frontier Cooperative Herbs. And uh, some of you have probably heard of them as well. 
they um, actually we still work with them today and we sell herbs to them um, on a regular basis. So uh, as we develop that, we start out very small, we with maybe just a half acre of, uh, of herbs the first year and uh, gradually grew into that. And of course, as we grew the, that part of our business, uh, you can imagine labor actually became a big part of the operation and uh, continues to be a big part today. Um, so over time, our, our herb operation grew and then uh, we continue to add things to our operation even now. My wife um, is responsible for taking care of uh, cut flowers and she has uh, been doing that for a couple of years. We also grow uh, vegetables, some vegetables and some fruits as well. So at this point, we, and we also have gr uh, greenhouse space that we use. Uh, and so um, with the combination of things, we keep fairly busy. Uh, but just that type of production, we keep pretty busy probably nine months out of the year, nine to ten months out of the year. So coming, uh, getting started with, the, with labor. Now, Luke, i got to ask you, how do I go ahead and advance the slides? There's an arrow in the bottom left corner yep. of that okay. uh, share screen. If you just okay. click that right arrow. Just to give you an idea of what our philosophy on labor is um, over the years as we've been developing our operation, um, I really find that labor is a great asset, but it also can be a very serious problem in that it is rather expensive. And so we really, um, I really am very conscious, try to be very conscious of that because um, it is extremely expensive. And so we, I try to uh, plan ahead as much as possible for even one day ahead, but even a week ahead if, if, if at all possible. And of course that's really difficult on a farm operation because the weather can really uh, raise havoc with those plans. And then um, we also, um, I also try to maintain that flexibility because of the weather. So I always, the one, that's one nice thing about having greenhouses is that if the weather turns bad outdoors where we're working, we generally can find something to do in the greenhouses that, um, that maybe we've neglected because of the good weather and then we can turn into the greenhouses and get some work done there. And so um, that has been a benefit that way. And then also just uh, for me to be realistic in budgeting time which you know over the years can uh, uh, you you tend to get a trend and you tend to understand how that works better each year and um, I continue to have to work on that um, I think it's really important and we talked a little bit about this with Morgan I talked with Morgan just a little bit before we got started tonight but uh, about managing people and I, I really feel that it's true that you must you, you must really like to be able to manage people if you have a sizable crew or at least be very efficient at doing it because it does take a lot of management especially in an agricultural situation where you're um, showing people how to do things on a regular basis um, you have to like to work with people and um, and try to develop some efficient skills at doing it if you're a person that um, just likes to work by themselves and just you know tends to uh, just like to get away from things and just work at your, you know, at a good speed by yourself. It's going to be more challenging for you than if you're uh, used to being able to manage people. Um, also, also then the final thing that we uh, really look at is um, I try to reduce labor as much as possible, based on uh, some of the things we've talked about. Um, Any time that I think a piece of equipment will be of any benefit to us and I can purchase it at a, a good uh, price, uh, I am more than likely going to look at doing that pretty seriously. And it's not that I don't like working with people and I, I, I really do like working with uh, people and the, our employees, but at the same time it's pretty costly. <clears throat> How we go about recruiting people I tend to stay with younger folks um, and that's kind of uh, where we've always been. I do get a fair number of 
uh, people from our local high schools in the area, uh, primarily from the FFA programs. And this has worked fairly well for us. Um, some of our students have used that used uh, our work uh, program as part of their educational pro program for FFA and they've used it in their projects that they need to have. And some of our students have actually done quite well at the state level and at the national level um, receiving awards. We've also worked with junior colleges and I've had uh, students, I, I will post about this time of year, actually if I have to do it a little earlier than this, post uh, job wanted descriptions at the various colleges. I've gone to Hawkeye Tech in the Waterloo area and then also over to Kirkwood Community College in Cedar Rapids. I have had some four-year college students and generally those are kids um, that have worked for me in the past and went to college and then are still looking for summertime jobs so they come back and work for us as well. So I don't generally get four-year students though as, uh, as um, employees straight out of the blue. Another option is the Workforce Center. And I, I've not used workforce as uh, a means of just getting general labor, but I have used them uh, in reference to the new Iowan Center. And that may be a possibility for folks. I, it's been a couple years now since I've talked to them, but uh, I'm assuming the program's still available. And we have had um, a number of uh, folks that have worked for us over the last couple of years that were from Mexico and uh, were good employees as well. So there's a few options. Also, local people, you know, in your in your uh, locally that may like to be outside and just want to uh, are interested in doing work in the fields and like like the idea of farming and and helping out. I've not had uh, I've never done too many internships as far as for uh, what you might call free internships or or uh, people that have um, lived with you and then work for you in the summer months. Um, I, I just never got into that um, process of doing that. Uh, that's definitely another possibility, though. When I go through the interview process with a, with someone, I like to get them out to the farm and uh, visit with them there, uh, give them a tour of the farm, and have give them an idea of what we're what we're doing there. Um, there's um, I kind of go through basically some of the points that I've listed there um, of, you know, basically I, I need to know that they're physically capable of doing hard work in the field, you know. That's obviously going to be something that you're going to look at right away. Another real important thing is reliable transportation. Um, this can definitely be an issue, and so I think that's something that you want to consider um, when you when you interview someone, whether they have us, if they're if they're not old enough to drive, um, whether you can actually pick them up if they're close by, or whether they have someone that can bring them to work. Um, otherwise, if they're older and they have a license, uh, just to make sure that they have uh, transportation. Uh, obviously, you look for previous experience. We like to get the kids that are from the farm background. And, you know, that's not to be too biased because there's some kids that live, grow up on a farm and have very little farm experience. So that doesn't always tell you everything, but um, we do look for that. You want someone that's self-motivated, and sometimes that's hard to determine when you first talk to them, but um, you, you try to get some ideas on, on whether they are or not. Uh, that's going to come in pretty, uh, it's an important attribute because there's going to be a lot of times when you're working in the field and uh, all of a sudden you need to go do something else and you're going to let your employees kind of take over and, and go at the job. And so um, you need people that are going to continue to work without supervision. Um, and then we all, I also kind of go through outline of expectations of, you know, being timely to work, um, break, how we expect, uh, if you have questions, make sure you uh, talk to me or or someone else that's in charge and just general things like that. So communication is really, uh, uh, communication is extremely important. And um, I, in the past, I've not uh, put all of my, all of this information down on paper, but we are going to do that this year where we kind of have, um, I don't know if you'd want to call it I guess you might call it an employee's manual, 
but it'd be extremely short. It's, it's not, wouldn't be anything that would be 10 pages long. It might be just a page or two pages. And basically address some of these things that I have uh, on the screen here of punctuality, making sure that everyone comes to work on time. That's a very extremely important uh, aspect of a person because if you have a crew that you want to send to work and, only, and you are missing two people because they come late to work, that's really holding you up in the field. And it's also uh, decreasing your efficiencies. Um, we want to have team players. We want people that can get along with everybody else. And uh, to, if there's problems between people, then I need to know about them. And then we have to talk, discuss that type of thing because that can happen from over time. Uh, of course, we talked about self-motivation, and that's uh, that's important, and we're going to describe that. Uh, proper attire is also uh, something that's pretty important. You know, sometimes uh, folks don't realize, you know, when they're when they're working outdoors, that weather can change fairly quickly, especially in the spring. You know, you can start out the day, and it's really a nice day. Uh, day. Uh, and then all of a sudden at noon it, it turns cloudy and windy and it looks like it's going to rain and the temperature drops 20 degrees. You want to make sure that people are aware that they need to have the proper uh, clothes available to work. I also keep clothes around um, that in case people are short on what they need to wear, we have that available for the most part that we can help them out. Now, what uh, what I what I think is important that I try to provide to employees, and this is probably kind of a short list, but this is these are things that I try to make sure that we do a good job of, and um, we we make sure that uh, everyone gets paid on a regular schedule. Uh, in our situation, we do it twice a month, at the fifteenth, and then at the end of the month. Um, but that's really flexible. There's really no rules that says that you have to do it that way. You could do it monthly. Um, I don't know if I would go much beyond monthly, but you could do it weekly. You know, it's really kind of up to you and how you want to st uh, structure that part of your business. Um, raises, uh, I, I find that's important. If someone's doing a good job, then I, I do give them raises. And if they're doing a really good job, I, I start out at a, a somewhat lower wage, but if they're doing a really good job, I move them up fairly quickly. And that's basically to reward them for good work, and hopefully that'll continue on as they're working for us. Um, the other aspect that you need to consider probably is to have some facilities available uh, for restrooms and clean water, for drinking water. Um, these are just uh, common things that you're, you're going to have to think about and, and want those available uh, for your employees. Um, not to try to get involved in OSHA aspects. I don't. I don't really want to get into describing that type of thing. But these are some things that you would probably have to address as far as OSHA is concerned. But with uh, most of our operations, um, the size that they are, we don't have to be concerned that much about OSHA coming to our farm and um, checking you on that. Okay, so. For the paperwork, which I know everyone loves to do, but it is pretty important uh, when you're when you have employees that you consider a lot of these things that I have here. Um, and basically, the first two that we have is the I-9 and the W-4 forms, and these are something that you're going to have a, a prospective employee or a new employee fill out once they come to work for you. With, you know, perhaps you know. Ideally, right away, the first day that they come, as have them get that paperwork done for you. The I-9 is employment eligibility, and all that is is basically having them sign uh, some information about uh, where they live, um, that they're U.S. citizens, and then they have to provide uh, a couple forms of ID to prove that they are uh, actual U.S. citizens. So that's important. The W-4, of course, is for taxes, and so you're going to use that for uh, right away. And that, that's uh, for you to get the information for their Social Security number, their address, uh, and then also the declarations on withholding uh, the amount of, um, oh, I can't think of the term right now, but the um, it's your allowances, I guess, that you're going to declare for taxes. Um, 
So that's important when it comes to figuring out your, um, t your federal income tax. Uh, workers' compensation is required. And so that is something, if you're going to be an employer, that you will have to consider getting. And I found this out uh, as we've developed along here that uh, the workers' compensation insurance is basically the same cost or same pricing at any company that you go to to, um, to get it. There, uh, it's kind of driven by the government, so each insurance company really does not charge um, higher or lower rates based on what you're doing. It's just kind of a set rate and that's um, how it works out. So really you can go to about any company to get workers' compensation. Um, in the example for a market, there's different categories for workers' compensation depending on the type of work they're doing. So if your employee is primarily doing market gardening, the rate of the tax is 3.27%. And so if you pay someone $100 uh, of work, of labor costs, you can assume that your insurance cost will be about $3.27. So just to give you an idea, if it's livestock that um, you have to declare, um, it would be 6.64%. So you would be charged for your, your um, your insurance cost would be $6.64 for every $100 that you spend in labor. Uh, and so that's uh, just to give you an idea what that cost is. Uh, payroll taxes, then, of course, I use the federal publication 51, which is the uh, Agricultural Employers Tax Guide. And that's that would be slightly different than uh, the nine. That's uh, what uh, we use is. Uh, for the 943 for agricultural work, but it's uh, 941 for general purpose, I believe, for, ag for people other than, that are working in places other than agriculture. I think it's a 941 form uh, for taxes at the end of the year. So this publication is a little book, is a booklet, and uh, describes, it really does a nice job of describing uh, your, your responsibilities of paying taxes uh, for labor. And so I've, I've listed here um, your Social Security costs uh, that you'll have to take out if you're paying a salary, which would be 4.2% for the employee, and you would take that out, and then six, and then you have to contribute 6.2%. In Medicare, it's an even split. It's 1.45% for the employee and the employer. And then the state of Iowa, I believe, is at a 4.5% that you're going to take out for the employee. And then, of course, you have the federal income tax. And that comes back to the federal publication where you can, um, what you can do is um, there's two ways to do it. There's a percentage basis of figuring out the taxes. Or if you go further back into the book, there's a set of charts that, um, based on the, the number of, um, you know, the word I was looking for is deductions, Based on the number of deductions the person declared on their W-4, uh, you would use that information and then how whether they're married or single, and then also the time frame that you pay people, whether it's monthly, bi-monthly, or weekly. Uh, you can go to the charts and figure out basically uh, exactly what you need to pay for federal income tax for that period for that time period. So uh, there's a lot of paperwork involved, and uh, definitely you know it's it's something that you you have to deal with. I mean, there's no way really around any of this. Um, workers' compensation has been a problem for me just because um, it they base your future, your next year's uh, insurance costs off of what you did the year previous. So if you had a big payroll the year previous, then you can expect that the premium for the next year is going to be higher, which I don't always agree with, but uh, actually I had some discussions with my uh, insurance company about it and we I was able to get it lowered because I knew that I was going to have less labor last year and I indeed did and so um, we were able to work that out. But that's one thing you have to consider and realize that if uh, that premium is high you need to question it and be uh, keep on top of it. Uh, there was also we were I've 
looked into piecework as well. And so just to give you a brief explanation of that, um, piecework is basically, uh, here's a picture of Diana, and she's harvesting flowers right now. And an example of that would be, say I, I told Diana that I want her to harvest uh, 10 bunches of 10 flowers each. And I would I basically then would pay her $1 for each bunch. So essentially she would get paid $10 for those 10 bunches. And that's basically what you would call piecework. And I wasn't, I haven't really done much of that, but we're getting to the point where we're going to look at that pretty hardly, or pretty seriously, because that, you know, especially when you're harvesting tomatoes and uh, other fruits and vegetables, I, there can be an advantage to that because it, it basically incentivizes your employees to work harder because they will get paid more per hour if they um, uh, work faster at what they're doing. So we're, we're considering looking at that more each year. And so I didn't know how the taxes worked on that, so I actually did call the IRS yesterday and, um, and visited with someone there, and we talked about it. They, they didn't seem to know a whole lot about it, but basically what the person told me to do in that respect is just to say at the end of the day, if you had $100 worth of uh, payment to a person for their piecework, then you would just take the taxes out of that uh, based on how you did it with your payroll taxes. So it really wouldn't change. You would just take the total amount that they earned and pull the taxes out of that. So that's kind of how that works. I was a little leery of calling the IRS, but uh, I thought, well, it would be good to know this and try to find this out. And they actually were fairly helpful in trying to figure that out. The other thing that people can, could, could consider, but I, I have looked at this and not really taken it very seriously, is independent contractors. Um, independent contractors, um, that's a really tough one when it comes to the IRS. There's approximately 20 rules that they look at in order for a person to be considered an independent contractor. So you're really, if that's what you're interested in doing, and basically what that'll do is save you from paying payroll taxes and Medicare and Medicaid uh, taxes. Um, or you know, save them from having the payroll, uh, uh, save them from having to pay the, uh, income tax, but it saves you from paying the Medicare and the Medicaid and, uh, and the, uh, the other one that, I uh, have to go back and look. Oh, Social Security tax, of course. That one you wouldn't have to pay. But the IRS is very particular about this, and uh, so you really need to be on top of it. Some of the things that you have to make sure of is that the person that's working for you, they bring their own tools. They would not be using any of your equipment. They would basically have to be considered their own company. And so um, at the end of the year, I think you, you still have to uh, fill out a 1099 for them and give that to them. And, uh, and then there's a lot of other rules of how they're paid. You need to do, uh, use, uh, pay them correctly in that regard. Uh, and so that's, that's, a, that's an interesting one. If you're really interested in doing that, I think you need to uh, sit down with a tax advisor or someone that uh, knows a lot about that and see if you can make sure you do it uh, the way the IRS wants you to do it. Uh, other things to consider that we try to do is provide uh, fringe benefits for our for our employees. Um, we've had uh, we tend to have employee gardens where uh, we'll we'll put some stuff in the greenhouse for them, whatever they want to do, and then uh, they can take it out and put it out in the field, and then have their own gardens. Um, and this works well; people really like to do that. We provide lunches for our employees. Uh, and then we try to, um, at times, we'll, um, if we can, once a week, each employee will, will be in charge of lunch for one day out of the week and just kind of builds camaraderie between the employees and uh, just a kind of a good social aspect of the job. And then also we've also done, like, gone, if we have the right uh, group of uh, employees, like we may go to a baseball game and I'll, I'll buy the tickets and, We'll go see a game in Cedar Rapids or, you know, try to do something like that that's a little added uh, on top of just being paid. Um, I tend to spend, try to spend as much time 
spend as much downtime with employees. I guess when I mean downtime is uh, like when we're at break and at lunch. I try to spend time visiting with them and try to get them get to know them a little better and uh, try not to feel like I'm just a boss that just shows up and tells them what to do all the time. I also try to work with the employees as much as I can. That sometimes has been difficult, but uh, I think that's really important so that they're not feeling, uh, employees don't feel that, uh, you know, that I'm off eating donuts somewhere or, you know, just doing things that, <laughs> you know, being lazy or whatever. So I try to work with them as much as I can and become a good example for them and for good, uh, good work habits. And then also it's pretty important that I found that I come in to work early and then I always stay later than what the employees do. Usually for working or coming in early, I try to get things set up for the day, getting equipment ready to go, getting tractors started if they need to be started and warmed up, um, just various things like that so that once the employees get there, they're going to work right away once they're there. Uh, and then I'm staying late, you know, I always have to make sure that I check on, uh, make sure you know, if we've got irrigation running that it's either turned off or I'll have to check on it, make sure everything's done okay. Um, Make sure the lights are turned off and the fans are turned off and you know things like that um, and just to see how the overall progress um, was in the afternoon or whenever they, they stopped working. So I think, uh, I think we're going to quit at that point and that kind of gives you an idea of how we look at this uh, on our farm and uh, I think I'll stop there turn it back to Luke. Thank you Eric. I, uh, I don't know about you, but I, I, I think you might be on a list somewhere now for calling the IRS, but I appreciate you doing that research for us. <laughs> uh, Morgan. That's what I was afraid yeah. of. <laughs> Morgan, uh, we'd love to have you uh, continue along and introduce yourself, and, uh, and then we'll get to questions from the audience. I also wanted to put in one more uh, plug for just clicking your radio button on the right there for that quick survey. And uh, you put your email address in the chat box, and we'll hear Morgan. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Morgan Honig, and uh, my business is Mogo Organic. Um, the reason it's called Mogo Organic is uh, because my little sister used to call me Mogo. Um, and that's my little sister and me in the picture there. Um, I have been farming for three years. This will be my actually fourth season coming up. Um, last year was my first year as a full-time farmer. Um, I had been farming, I've been working full-time and farming for a couple of years and uh, did pretty well with two jobs and thought I could do it all by myself last year. and. Um, found out I, I couldn't. I have um, uh, about three acres that I tried to farm this year, and I could only manage about one and a half acres by myself, it seems. The weeds got away from me. Um, but I grow mostly vegetables, lettuce and tomatoes, and green beans are my hot sellers. Um, I also like to grow a lot of heirlooms and herbs and black and I pick wild blackberries. I've got three acres of wild blackberries on my farm. And um, I also grow a lot of flowers for cut flowers and I do some floral work on the side because my previous job was as a florist. Um, my farm is um, actually is my grandparents' land. They neither of them farmed. They were um, just, they were just, I, my grandma didn't work, my grandfather was a doctor, they just sort of liked the idea of the farm life and had some chickens and a couple cows and that was about it. Um, but my grandpa did buy a tractor and that is the tractor that I'm still using today. So I was lucky I moved in with a fully equipped farm. Um, the land was pretty much unused for about 20 to 25 years before I moved in. So I had a jump start on the organic land part. Um, so I've just spent the last couple of years getting, this, getting the, the soil quality built up. It was pretty clayish soil. Um, and I've just been doing a lot of experimenting with varieties of plants. And um, yeah, so 
Um, yeah, so that's me and my sister. We were not farm girls, but we're learning how to be farm girls. Um, we actually grew up in a greenhouse. Um, our house is the, the top story of that building there. Um, and uh, my parents had a flower shop and greenhouse, and my father also did landscaping. So I was heavily involved in the plant world, um, but I didn't have to do much actual work because my dad had employees. So I ended up just pretty much roller skating through that greenhouse. It was a nice winter roller skating rink and uh, didn't even have to mow the lawn or anything. <laughs> Dad had people to do that. So I didn't really uh, do too much labor as a child. Um, I've grown to like it now. Um, there's a picture of me and my, I'm the middle one and my brother and sister. And the greenhouse there that you're seeing is a uh, we used to call that the tropical plant house, and we used to grow tropical plants in there, but now it is currently my father's tomato hothouse, and he's growing tomatoes conventionally, and I'm growing them organically, and we're having a bit of a competition this year, so. Um, here's some more pictures of the greenhouses that I we had. on the In the top picture, um, the, the two greenhouses that you can see are now gone. Um, they were built in the early 1900s, I think, and um, used to be steam heated. It was the first greenhouse on this side of the Mississippi, I believe. Um, but uh, they got, those greenhouses were really old, and we had to have them taken down. It was cheaper to remove them than it was to repair them. Um, so, but the greenhouse below with the little cute old lady, that's my grandma. And that greenhouse is still there. And um, my grandmother used to work for my parents for free, <laughs> pretty much transplanting plants. It was something that I think she really enjoyed. And um, I was working in that greenhouse today, and it was just absolutely beautiful, about 85 degrees, and got lots of stuff planted. Um, so there's sort of a long history of free labor <laughs> in our family. Um, Let's see, there's a picture of me in my cold frame. Um, this is just a little history of my farm. Um, I, didn't, I didn't intend on being a farmer at first. Um, I was just selling vegetables at the farmer's market in, uh, just to make some extra cash to pay off my student loans, that sort of thing. And I was doing fairly well at the farmer's market, so I... Um, our local chamber office had a business plan competition, and I wrote a business plan, and they gave me the money to um, build this, my cold frame. Um, and so I really hadn't intended on farming, but with the, with the push from the local chamber and the money to build a cold frame, I was sort of suddenly in business. So, um, so in 2008, I had my first year as, with a CSA. And um, I tried not to have too, I tried not to have too many members, but I still let 20 in, which is way too many for my first year. Um, but I learned the hard way and got it done. And the next year, I stuck, tried to stick around 20 again, and I did much better. Um, last year, I had 30 customers, and if the weather would have been a little bit nicer, I think I would have done even better. But I'm aiming for 45 this year. Um, let's see. Oh, and then in the last couple of years, I've also done some, made some changes to the farm. Um, we've renovated my barn, and we planted um, probably 30 blueberries and about 30 raspberries and about 200 asparagus roots. So um, got a lot of stuff to look forward to. Um, this is a picture of my little sister at the farmer's market. She bakes bread as well, um, but uh, I just mostly sell at the farmer's market and my CSA, and then that little blue building there was my parents opened another flower shop, and so I had a, I sold a lot of my pumpkins and decoratives to them. Here's a picture of my mom and uh, planting asparagus. 
Um, looks like those trenches are really, really long, but actually they end at the shovel there. Um, and then on the right is some lettuce um, that I accidentally overwintered a couple years ago. I tried to get a late planting in, and uh, they didn't. They weren't ready in time, so I just covered them up with some leaves. And the next spring, I had lettuce instantly. So um, that's something. That's a mistake that I was happy to have made because it's um, made for early profits the last couple of years. Um, Oh, this is something that was pretty incredible. The president visited my farm last April, which was really good for business. It brought a lot of attention, drew a lot of attention to my farm and organic farming. Um, it was pretty cool, uh, pretty overwhelming. I have to look at these pictures to remind myself that it happened because I was um, sort of in a in a daze when it happened to me, but. Um, uh, they were touring Iowa, especially my area of the state, because there is um, a really high unemployment rate here, and the economy is pretty bad. And um, they were just trying to focus on entrepreneurs. And um, the the man in the jacket there is Secretary of Agriculture Vilsack. And he, he had an agenda as well, and he was uh, promoting a lot of USDA programs. And there's a lot of programs available for young farmers and um, uh, disadvantaged, I don't like that word, but that's what they use, um, farmers, females. And um, that's, um, and uh, yeah, so I, did, I wasn't taking advantage of any USDA programs then, but I am currently working on a couple grants and working with USDA people now. So. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for people there. Um, having the president and the secretary visit my farm was awesome for business, but um, I spent an awful lot of time cleaning the farm and mowing areas of the farm that I've never mowed before, and uh, nothing got planted for those first couple weeks in April. So it actually kind of set me back a little bit because – after the president left, it rained for two weeks, so um, it was still a good experience. Um, this is a picture of my barn. This is what it looked like when I moved on to the farm. Um, nobody had tended to it for 20 years, and um, the roof had completely rotted away. The baseboard had rotted away, and um, the barn was a really cool old barn, it was made out of, there weren't any nails in it, um, it was just the pegs, the holes, and the wooden pegs, and um, I haven't found out exactly when it was built yet, but I'm still kind of researching that. Um, so this is my main goal, I wanted to make this barn into a workshop, and um, I had a fellow working on my well one day, and he told me he was, he thought the best way to fix it would be to burn it down, and um, that motivated me to you knock that. So um, we kind of tore off the wall, cut down some trees, and framed a new wall and roof. And then I um, acquired a lot of recycled materials to fix it up. Um, the tin and we used some pieces of my dad's old greenhouses. And um, down below are some wine bottles um, that I I'm making a beautiful little greenhouse feature. Um, that's that's the final product. It's painted there. Um, and the theory behind the wine bottles, it's something I saw on TV one time. Um, and it's the heat from the sun goes in the, the butt of the bottle, and then it kind of wells up inside. And then at night, when it gets cooler, it's supposed to push that, that warm air out into your building. And my barn isn't insulated yet, so I haven't felt the effects, but it looks pretty. Um, there's the what it looks like from the inside. Um, I use this part of the barn mostly to um, hold over transplants. I uh, start all my seeds in uh, my dad's greenhouse because it's heated, and um, he does have all the materials available there for transplanting and containers and things, and um, so I start my seeds there, and then I haul them 
south of town to my farm. And um, if I can't get them planted that day, this is sort of where they they sit in the barn until I'm ready. Can't leave them outside because I have lots of rabbits. Um, let's see. So this is sort of an overview of my farm. Um, I mostly do vegetables, but I also do just about everything else. I kind of, I just love it all. Um, I've got three acres tilled up now, but um, I actually have probably, I probably have about 60 acres of tillable land. My goal for the next couple of years is to get up to 10 acres. Um, but I have to manage the three first. Um, I, so I have a cold frame, my, a 72-foot cold frame, um, and then I recycled some pieces of another old greenhouse. That's the bottom right-hand picture. Um, I used the hoops of one of my dad's old greenhouses, and I recycled the plastic. Um, the Hy-Vee Garden Center in town was just going to throw away that plastic. They used it for one year. So I recycled it, and I'm doing some kale and stuff in there now. And then the front of that greenhouse is made out of um, old windows and greenhouse pieces that I picked up all over town. Um, people will set their trash out on the curb, and I'm happy to pick it up if it looks useful. Um, so that's sort of my makeshift uh, little greenhouse there, and it's, it's quite nice. Um, and then I've also got my dad's greenhouses to utilize, and, um, and uh, we only actually heat one of those greenhouses now, so I won't really be utilizing them tons. I don't use, use them tons in the winter, but I use them a lot in the spring and the fall. Um, and then I have my little, my little blue Ford tractor that my grandfather left, so um, that's what I have to work with on the farm, and that little tractor is, is my best employee, I think. Um, here's some other pictures of employees. My mother there with the bare feet planting onions. My brother, who just lives out of town, and he comes on the weekends sometimes to help me out, mostly with the, uh, he's really good with electrical work. He helps a lot in the barn. Um, and then down below is my sister-in-law, who even came to work when she was eight months pregnant, and her friend. Um, and here's me and Dad putting up the second green cold frame. And um, I, right, it was kind of the end of the season there, and I had some squash already planted, and I was going to try to extend the season on those a little bit, but I don't think that crop didn't end up turning out for that good. I think we squished it. <laughs> Um, and there's my main team. It's me, mom, my sister, sister-in-law is in there all the time, and then my little dog. She's pretty good at catching rabbits. Um, but I, up until this point, uh, all my employees have been family and friends. Um, a lot of times I'll have a big, when I had to have a trench dug around the first cold frame, put some tiling in, um, I had a big barbecue. I have lots of friends over and that worked out pretty good. We we dug that trench in just a couple hours. Um, but I pretty much pay everybody in food, fun, and thank you. So um, so far, I haven't actually. I personally haven't even taken tons of <laughs> much of a wage out of my um, out of what I've earned. So I'm a little nervous um, to jump into the employee thing, but I know that. I know it's something that I need to do because I, I don't think my farm can grow anymore beyond where it's at if I don't have more help. So, um, let's see. You covered a lot of the questions that I had, but um, let's see. Um, well, okay, I have a, one little question about the workman's compensation insurance. How does that work with um, volunteers? Well, that that's a real good question. I I think it, as long as I mean, if they're not being paid, I guess you. I mean, you wouldn't be required to have it. 
but maybe you would I don't know that's a real good question because maybe you would still want to have it in case someone got hurt um, that's a real good question I, I can't tell you the uh, answer for that one for sure what uh, how that should be handled does anyone else have an idea Looks like Sally is saying that um, your liability should maybe take over at that point, which I think that probably does that would probably make some sense. And then, and then, really, your co workers' compensation would just be for uh, salaried or hourly paid employees. So I, I think that could be. Um. Now we're good. We're getting all kinds. Of yeah, I've got all my questions out of order now. <laughs> we're getting some good response though. Here, there's uh, Caitlin is mentioning that uh, they carried workman's comp on her when she was uh, when she was a volunteer. So I don't know. It looks like we're we're kind of. That's uh, I think that's something we're going to have to really check into for sure. But that might be a possibility. Um. Just ask my insurance provider, perhaps. Yeah, I would definitely. I think so. Yeah, I would go to check with them. Yeah, we. Uh, one of the questions too from Jake is mentioning uh, liability, and we do ha we do definitely carry liability insurance, and um, right now we carry um, two million dollars, and that sounds sounds like a lot, and you think maybe the premium is a lot, but it's really not that much um, and that's I think that's that's primarily for uh, visitors um, that come onto your farm or or if you you know God forbid you would have a food uh, issue like um, E. coli or you know some unusual thing like that um, that's the uh, that is applied for that so yeah I um, the, the, for what you get for liability insurance, the cost of it is really not that, not so bad. And uh, it looks like we're getting some, you know, for workman's comp. Uh, most insurance, or a lot of insurance companies carry it. We get it through Farm Bureau, uh, Farm Bureau uh, insurance, but I know there's other companies that carry it. And like I mentioned earlier, the the price of it shouldn't change from carrier. It should be very close to the same price, whoever you go to. Um, how do you keep track of employee hours? Do you have do you just have a set time that people come in, or do you have them do, they, do you have them sign in their hours, or um, how do you organize that? Yeah, we're we're pretty um, we're not too regimented on that. We what what I'll do is um, I have a larger calendar that I keep in my office, and everyone uh, at the end of the day records their hours on that calendar. Now this year we're going to probably get a little. We're getting to the point where we're diversified enough that I want to keep track of the hours of where everyone is working, and so we're going to try to break that down a little bit more and try to keep an idea of, uh, you know, how many hours each day they spend on doing certain jobs. And we do some of that already, tracking in our greenhouses to see what we're doing there. But that's that's really a good thing to have uh, available so that you can get an idea of what your real costs are. And that's we have been doing that in our greenhouses to try to get an idea of the cost of production in greenhouses. And do you expect? Do you have um, like when when say someone's picking tomatoes? Do you expect them to be? Do you have? I don't know how to ask this. Do you know how long? Do you have a good idea how long it's going to take somebody to pick? a certain crop. That's something I have troubles figuring out even with myself and I consider myself a pretty experienced harvester. Yeah, that that's a good question because I I generally what I do is if it's something new that we're working on, I will um, work with them 
for a while, maybe a half hour to an hour for sure. So it gives me an idea, a better idea of what the what we're doing and what it's going to cost us to do it. And then I can start making some calculations and and seeing if this is going to work out in the long run or whether we need to make changes on how we do something. So that that's really been the way I've done it. I I've, I've never ever seen information that will say, you know, you know, it t you can pick uh, 100 pounds of tomatoes in one hour. You know, there's I've never really have run across anything like that. And so I, I usually I usually work with the employees, so I get an idea of what it should take, how much time it should take to do something, and then um, I check with them periodically to see how it's going. If things are not going like I expect, then I work with them again and try to figure out what the problem is. Sometimes there is a problem, and it's not necessarily that they're screwing around or not getting their job done. There's just other issues that is uh, taking more time to do it. So, um, yeah, I, I probably the way I so, try to solve that problem is just working with them um, and trying to figure out how that's going to work out. Um. And do you have any tips on uh, reducing labor as far as harvesting and things go? Are there any tricks that you've learned um, that you should that I should be passing on to to my employees to help them be more efficient? Yeah, um, as I, I kind of mentioned, you know, a little bit is that I I really try to avoid. Uh, I try to use mechanical harvesting if if that's at all possible. But um, one one thing to really think about is making sure that your employees are comfortable. Um, for example, uh, if you're harvesting something and it's hard to harvest and and it's just a lot easier to do it with gloves, try to make sure that you have gloves available for them so that um, so that they're able to do their job without having their hands sore or you know it just makes things a lot easier if you have gloves on to harvest certain things some things it doesn't I mean sometimes you just can't harvest with gloves on it's just easier but uh, without gloves but um, making sure that employees are comfortable um, make sure they have the right clothes because if they're out there uh, and it's cold outside and they're shivering and uh, you know they're they're not really thinking about their job they're thinking about how cold it is out there and so I always think about that, and I always try to think about how how I can make their job easier, so that uh, they can really focus on being efficient at their job. So that's that's probably one thing to consider when you're out there. Uh, equipment, like say you're out hoeing weeds or you're doing something like that, just make sure that they have the right tool to do the job. Uh, sometimes, if you're not around when they start a job, they grab a a hoe that just is, you know, just doesn't. It's not an efficient way to do something, and so um, that, that's probably a big thing is try to be around when they start a job to make sure everyone has the right equipment and has the right clothes and uh, and are prepared to work at a, a fairly efficient rate. So that those would be some things to consider. I think that's all the major questions I have at the moment. Great. That, in that case, we can open up questions from the audience. And then, Morgan, if you have something that comes to your mind, you can always jump in. Is that, does that sound fair? Sounds fair to me. I know Lily had a bunch of questions that she had sent to me, so I think I'll just uh, copy those over to uh, the chat box and uh, encourage everybody to put your questions in the, in the chat box, and we'll answer them one at a time.
Eric, you can feel free to begin uh, answering as, as you're ready. I would, with the uh, employees and their vehicles for delivering CSA, I guess I would be a little concerned about that. We, we don't, um, we don't have our employees use their own vehicles. Um, so I, th I think that um, you'd be better off uh, <clears throat> not using employee vehicles, but um, using your own vehicles if at all possible. Um, just, I, I'm not sure how the liability issue would be on that if they would get into an accident. Um, but that's something you could check with your insurance provider on. Um, I guess I'd, I'd be concerned about that and definitely check with an insurance provider to make sure um, about that. Yeah, yeah, there's a good question about efficiency and um, as far as going from one job to another and what a lot of times what I'll do is if um, if I have something that needs to be done in the morning and uh, I put I get a crew together and I get them started on it and then uh, I'll leave them and then I'm always thinking ahead to what's going to happen next I have a general idea of when they're going to get done with that with that job and so I'm busy preparing other things like for instance, if we're going to transplant that day, um, I will send them to do another job that needs to be done, like maybe harvest tomatoes in a greenhouse, and they'll do that for maybe an hour or two. And while that's going on, then I'm getting the tractor hooked up to the transplanter, getting the get, getting the tank full of water, make sure the tractor is filled with fuel, and uh, getting the transplants ready to go, so that uh, when they're done with that job, then we um, we move directly over, and uh, we don't lose any time in that regard. Um, you know, if you if you have a group, say, of five, four or five people that are going to transplant, and the tractor's not hooked up, all of a sudden you're going to have one person hooking up the tractor, and you're going to have three or four people standing around watching. And those types of jobs I try to do on my own and have them ready to go, so that um, when we want to work in a crew, they're all working, and they're all working together, and there's not uh, too much standing around or not knowing what to do. Um, so that's how I approach that. Um, you know, just try to get yourself ready. And of course, early in the mornings, I, I get there ahead of time and make sure all that type of work is done so that we can move right along and uh, keep that crew moving at work. Um, well, that's, that's probably one of the bigger things as far as switching from one job to the next. Um, that we need to that we I try to do is make sure that it's a smooth transition. I do remember that uh, there was a question earlier about breaks, paying for breaks. I do pay breaks, and we'll do uh, a 10-minute uh, break in the morning and a 10-minute break in the afternoon. And yeah, I, I pay. That's a paid break. Um, I don't pay for lunch hours, but I do pay for the breaks. So. Uh, and then, I, as I recall, there was another uh, question about uh, about um, uh, what I what I pay for labor, um, and I start out usually around eight dollars and about eight fifty an hour, and uh, and then uh, this kind of leads me to another point. I usually put people and I tell them that we're going to be on a basically on a oh. Uh, a trial period of two weeks and uh, see how things work out, uh, see how well they perform. And after that end of that two weeks, if things are going well and, and they're understanding how things are going, then I can give them a 25 cent raise at that point. And then after that, it's based on performance. If um, if there's something, someone that comes in and they're they're doing a nice job and all of a sudden I can put more responsibility on them and they can handle that, then I, I definitely increase their pay because I want them to stay around. If we have employees that are not able to do that and um, you know are just not 
not up to that level, uh, they do an okay job but are not able to take on additional responsibility, then I don't increase their pay quite as fast. I'm kind of uh, kind of answering questions over the mic if that's okay. It's probably faster than me trying to type in the type in answers. Is that okay with you, Luke? Yes, yes, that's great. I prefer that. Yeah, this uh, Jake uh, has an interesting question about um, uh, pruning and seasonal workers for that. And I think you know that might be one one area based on how you're describing it. That might be one area where you could use contract workers, and that might make sense because you could go, uh, come to a, a group of uh, people, and of course. What in in the case of migrant workers, a lot of times they will have a crew, a crew boss, or a a person that's basically in charge of them, and that that person uh, basically negotiates with the farmer and says, "Well, I the farmer says I have 20 acres of apple trees that I need to get pruned before before uh, uh, April." So this crew chief will come and say, "Well." We can get that done for you, and it'll cost this amount of money. And then Jake would say, "Okay, you probably do some negotiating, and you might say, well, I don't know, that might be a little overpriced, or you know, maybe there's some other negotiating uh, aspects that you could discuss, and then come back with a price on that, and then figure out how the terms will occur with uh, payment and how the job's going to get done. And of course, they're bringing in their own equipment um, to do the job. You're not going to provide any equipment for that. Uh, you're only probably going to pay the, the boss or the team leader, and then he's the one that pays the rest of the employees. And so I can see uh, contract labor where that might be a possibility uh, using for that job. You know, uh, one thing about getting getting things ready, you know, there's times um, if you don't have the time and you have equipment to, that needs to be, has some maintenance done on it, um, maybe that's a situation where you, you know, you have friends or uh, relatives that can get your equipment up to speed for you so that um, when you get into the growing season, you're not having to worry a whole lot about that. Um, you know everything is in good shape, and you know I could see in Morgan's situation she has a lot of good uh, support already for that, and so but maybe it's uh, she knows what she wants to do in the in the future growing season, so she can sit down here in the next couple weeks and look over her equipment and uh, make a list of things that need to be done before the growing season comes on, and then she can pick out her friends or let her dad or her brother or you know someone like that that can work on these types of projects before we get going into the growing season because you really uh, there's a lot of times where you don't want to have downtime uh, when you're out in the field because something uh, broke or you know something just maybe wasn't maintained as well as you wanted and I'm guilty of that as anyone um, uh, but I like to try this time of year to get everything up to snuff and ready to go so that when you go to the field you know, you don't have to worry about issues with equipment because that can really be a, a really um, wet blanket on the day, and uh, it can really cost you a lot of money, especially when you have a lot of people like transplanting. I think that's one of the biggest examples of um, where if you don't have equipment up to snuff and you're out there fixing equipment and you have five people standing around not really doing anything, uh, you're you're losing money on that situation. Okay, um, Todd mentioned about uh, culinary and medicinal herbs, and we currently grow medicinal herbs, and uh, we do we do it on the wholesale level. Um, it it's uh, it's not the easiest 
area to be in, Todd, because uh, you do, I mean, we've established some, um, oh, how do I want to say it? We, we've, we've established credibility with a lot of our buyers, and so they, they can rely on us for things. Um, a lot of the companies, like in Frontier, uh, Cooperative Herbs would be a great example. When we first started getting into uh, growing medicinal herbs, um, there was a little bit of a, a Frontier was looking for uh, farmers to do this. And they were having um, they were having people call them, uh, you know, they would have like 10, 15 farmers calling over a week's time interested in getting started. And Frontier was very helpful trying to do that. But as time went on, they realized that um, the vast, vast majority of those uh, farmers really ended up not producing much, if anything, for them. And so they, they became more reluctant to uh, help farmers get started uh, growing herbs. And so it, it's, uh, it, it's a challenge. It really is a challenge, like, uh, like you said uh, there. Um, but I don't, I'm not going to discourage you from trying it. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that if it's something that you're really set on doing, that uh, I would, you know, consider it. But uh, definitely don't go into it jump with all feet and, you know, make a big splash about it. I would definitely go at a very, uh, very small scale first until you get, uh, get going into that area and, and just kind of build your business gradually and you can get a feel for how the business works. So... We yeah we'll definitely be we will continue growing uh, medicinal herbs but um, for a new person you know it it is a challenge it's something that you definitely would start out small with uh, Jake's asking about livestock and we do have hogs on our operation and so um, but they they're not a, a big part of the operation so um, we're not going to increase in the size of that um, particular part of our business and um, so but you know that's definitely you know if you're looking for employees and you're trying to balance it between livestock and uh, and um, field production that could be a challenge because there's not many people that are um, uh, first of all, that are interested in working with livestock, and then second of all, are going to be any good at it. And so um, that's that's a real challenge to find someone good with livestock. Um, that's difficult. So um, it can be trained, I think. But you know, over the years, I've had some of our employees work with me, and you know, that's just a whole another realm of um, work. And so it, it's a big learning curve, and they've only helped me on a very limited basis on how to work with livestock. It's something that, you know, a lot of us have grown up with and so we just know how to work around them, but if it's someone that's never been around them, they will not really understand how that works. So, um, yeah, that's that's an interesting thing to consider and so it could be a real challenge. Morgan, do you plan on adding anything to your operation, like chickens or anything like that? I'm looking into chickens and goats, perhaps. I'm looking for somebody who can clean up the fields for me a little bit. But um, I'm hoping to get a handle on the garden. I want to. I've lost control of the garden with the weeds the last couple of years. So I told myself no livestock until I can control the weeds first. Yeah. Yeah, our our, um, our hog operation is basically just crossbred. Nothing, nothing really uh, unusual. It just kind of goes back to some of the older, more uh, general breeds that uh, we used to see a lot of. Just York, uh, I think more of a York and uh, 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 Hamp crosses that that type. But I've not uh, worked with the with the um, with these Guinea hogs, so I'm, I'm not not too familiar with them. Yeah, and then like and like you mentioned, workman's comp is higher uh, for livestock. I think I did mention something about it. So, yeah, I mean that that's something that you to, when you do uh, declare workman's comp, basically they're going to ask you um, 
for each employee how much time they spend with livestock, how much time for row crop, how much time for uh, market gardening, and they're going to categorize that. And then that's how they break down the, uh, the cost of the insurance. So it really makes sense, and, and I'm in that same way with livestock. I'm the only one or maybe one other employee that works with, well, actually my son works with me with livestock. So and I don't I, I don't have him on workman's comp so um, that's how it works for us and so we, yeah we don't have any additional employees working with livestock. You know one thing about talking about diversification and I I, I imagine that people think that um, when you're that diversified that it's very um, it's very hard to do things, but for me, it actually is a benefit because we have a variety of jobs that can get done, and they're not, they don't all have to happen at the same time. So uh, just as we were mentioning, if it rains, we're outside transplanting and it rains, and we have greenhouses that we can work in, then we move everyone to the greenhouse and do what we need to do in those. So um, that's been very, uh, very beneficial for our operation, and, and uh, I, I, I run into this every year that uh, we, you know, we're in the field and we've neglected the greenhouses for a while. So if it rains, where do we go to the greenhouses? We are either harvesting or trellising or pruning. Um, it seems like there's always something that can be done, especially if you haven't done anything in those greenhouses for a while. So that that's worked well, and then also working with different crops, you know. You're not harvesting every crop at the same time, so the diversification is really uh, helpful so that you can uh, spread that workload out over a longer period because it's really hard to get employees to work for you for only a couple weeks out of the summer. When you're going to employ someone, you're going to want to employ them for three or four months or, or longer if you can. If you can only tell an employee that you can only employ them for maybe three weeks, chances are they're going to be looking for a different job because they need to have more... Uh, Greater income, a greater income stream, especially if they're, card, uh, uh, if they're college students, they're always going to be looking for income for the entire summer. So that's something you have to consider when you're looking to hire someone that you can keep them busy, hopefully for the entire summer. Yeah, uh, crop insurance. That's a huge one. Um, Right now we do not, and that that's a it's a big issue. Um, it's a good question. You know that, that's one of the biggest dilemmas. That um, I was at a meeting where uh, one of our representatives, uh, Joe Holcomb from the Iowa City area, and the state legislator, um, we, <laughs> we got onto this subject and. Um, and it's probably not so much necessarily a state issue, but a federal issue with the USDA as far as trying to get some suitable insurance uh, methods for insuring crops. Um, it's a huge liability for farm, for us, as, uh, especially crop growers, and uh, it's something that needs to be addressed. So, no, at this point, we really I don't have uh, uh, that kind of insurance for those crops. So, you're definitely got an issue with that. Some and you, I know that in the like in the southeast in Florida and those places, I'm I, I'm pretty sure that they do have insurance, crop insurance, but it's rather expensive, and you can imagine why. But um, I know that Farm Bureau has been working on this a little bit, but I'm not sure where they are at this time as far as trying to insure crops. Okay, um, in dealing with the growing herbs, we we uh, don't have any crops that we grow. We do grow out in the fields. We grow uh, uh, medicinal herbs. Uh, this last year, we had approximately 80 acres of medicinal herbs in the field, and then uh, but we don't grow anything under woods or forested or shaded areas. But that's definitely one possibility to consider. So. Um, Shade, I have worked with shade cloth. Um, it's a hassle. And I've had uh, <clears throat> one or two instances where uh, uh, I had one extreme windstorm that blew my shade off. And that was uh, something that uh, 
was uh, quite a hassle. And then uh, also in the fall one year, I uh, didn't get my shade off soon enough, and we got a heavier snow. And I was out there in the middle of a snowstorm getting the getting the shade taken down and making sure that uh, we didn't have seven or eight inches of snow on that. That would have been a, a big uh, issue. Uh, would have collapsed the whole thing probably, but I was able to get the job done. Um, but uh, if you're looking at shade crops, I definitely would consider using a wooded or forested areas to do that. We do have uh, uh, employees in the fall, uh, not real late in the fall probably. Uh, and then also if I can get uh, pe local people that might want to work in the fall, we've done that. This past year we've done some, we did that to help out in some harvesting. Um, so we we try to do about any combination, and we and you know I'm about ready to get employees in here real soon now. Okay, uh, Garrett's got a good question about uh, employees being on call, and uh, and when it comes to the summer months, I basically have um, everyone come in and we tend to have enough work to do for the day you know that, that usually works out fairly well um, but some weeks are going to have more uh, work than others and so we, we don't guarantee a set amount of hours per week um, and you know with weather the way it is um, it can be hard to do um, but all of our workers tend to end up working very, really close to a 40-hour week, uh, some a little longer than that, depending on the, the what we're doing at the time. So I, I just try to gauge the number of employees that I have. And I, I make a budget this time of year um, trying to get a rough estimate of how much I'm going to spend on uh, payroll for the year. And then I hire accordingly. You know, some employees only want to work maybe three days out of the week. Uh, some want to work uh, five days or six days a week and want 10 hours a day. So you evaluate that when you hire someone to uh, determine how that's going to work out and then see how it fits into your budget. But I do try as hard as I can. You know, it's not going to be 100%, but I try to set up a, a, uh, a budget right away, This getting right now about this time of year. Actually, I've done some of that already. Is about how much I'm going to spend on labor for the year. That question about the baked goods, um, at the moment they're sold under the cottage industry laws, um, but uh, we have actually in our area a community kitchen is in the is in the works, so we're looking forward to using a commercial kitchen very soon. Um, and I am pretty sure I I'm pretty sure that. Um, the laws are going to be changing on some of that stuff soon. I've heard word that um, uh, most baked goods will have to be made in commercial kit kitchens soon, within the next couple of years. And I've heard that about the goats, too. I know, someone told me if you're going to get goats, you have to double up all the fences because they'll go through them. <laughs> so I'm pretty excited. I would really like to get goats, too. OK. Uh... And health insurance, that's no, no, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, for health insurance, we have health insurance on ourselves. Uh, you know, our family. Well, I, I, I have health insurance for myself through the farm. Um, I have to. I'm. I. I'm pretty. I. Uh, just I just working on the tractor and working out on the farm by myself. I made a 
made a point to um, be able to do the health insurance thing. Um, and I, and I, it's kind of expensive for myself, so I, I don't know if I would, um, I don't think I would be able to afford it for employees. Yeah, that, that's, we're basically in the same situation. We have uh, health insurance for our, our family, of course, but, <clears throat> but for employees, we don't, and that, and, you know, that, that's something that you would carry on a more regular basis, and for employees that are part-time, uh, that wouldn't really be the, I don't, it's probably not worth, it'd be, there'd be other ways maybe to give them benefits than uh, health insurance. Um, there might be other ways that you could do that. Um, <clears throat> going back to the um, uh, workman's comp, we do not have workman's comp on ourselves, and that's something to consider now when if you are going to do that. The insurance companies um, will, if you're not careful about it, they will have you covered under workman's comp as well. Now, you can go ahead and do that if you want, but you really don't need to do that because I'm not going to, I have, I have my own, um, not workman's comp, but it's um, uh, disability insurance. So that's what I would use if I get hurt. And that's, um, in, and then with family members, it would be a similar, we would go probably through health insurance and, and avoid the workman's comp. So really, you only need to carry workman's comp on employees that you're um, going to hire. That's really the main where, place to carry it. And make sure that they're not covering you. Well, I don't want to tell you what to do, but in our case, we do not cover ourselves under workman's comp. So... Um, Well, there's a little lull in questions. I just wanted to thank everyone for coming. We've got another few minutes, so if you have a one last question, we, we right now we're not it. selling any but, uh, products really appreciate through, Eric um, but it require us to do that putting together because the it's just too expensive and, for us at this Eric, point, especially to make for worthwhile. sharing. Yeah, uh, the gap and the audits and, and food safety and yeah, that's a uh, as you're developing um, uh, hiring people. You you have to consider your employees and and we have SOPs then that are established for our gaps and the employees read those and uh, are familiar with those so that when they go to harvest tomatoes or greens, they they follow the directions on those uh, gaps. And then also when it comes to using the restrooms and breaks and things like that, you have to be, um, they need to be well aware that they need to wash their hands before and after eating and uh, using the restrooms. So yeah, that's that's a big part of GAP is employees because that tends to be probably the largest area where contamination occurs. And Caitlin, yeah, I think you had a nice point about the workman's comp. Um, uh, that's an interesting thought to consider. Um, I try to avoid having any kind of claims, though, like Kate is mentioning here, because she's right. Uh, I, I think workman's comp insurance is extremely overpriced to begin with, and uh, she's right. If you have claims, look out. Your, your coverage will go up. It'll go real high. We have had issues where, you know, we've had small scrapes, like a few people have had uh, uh, stitches or things like that, 
and because they uh, they cut themselves with a knife or whatever. And you know, I'll take care of that and make sure I take care of the doctor bill and everything, and then I pay them for time. But I, I if it's something small like that, I I don't tend to necessarily report it completely. So. Yeah, and Caitlin makes a good point. Only if you can if you can cover it yourself, you know, that's a big part of it. It's just a it is a big catch twenty two. Insurance is just that way. Yeah, I hope Melville, uh, Mel, Mel, that you, um, you know, something that gap is really interesting, and you know, at the very least, if you don't get yourself certified, you've learned a lot about uh, food safety, and so you can really use a lot of that on your farm, even if you don't certify. So, um, it, I'm sure it was worthwhile to go to the training, even if you don't necessarily get certified. Don't know how many questions I can you can email them to me if you want. <laughs> yeah, uh, 